Hello, everybody. I'm Will Willeman, and it's joined by Stanley Howell and we're reading BART together. And today we launch into beginning in chapter five, where BART gets into the heart of the creed. Uh, Stanley, you've been, uh, you've said repeatedly uh, in my hearing that when most people use the word God, they don't know what they're talking about. That sounds like a thought perhaps engendered here by dogmatics and outline. First of what all, do Will, we mean? First of all, Will, why are you dressed up? Uh, I'm, I'm looking for some authority. You know, oh. you don't have to dress up, but I do. Uh, right. And all those of you who wrote me saying, please get Stanley to look into the microphone. And uh, I got a headset on him, so he's ready. Hey, I'm uh, ready. Back to the theological question. Fine. Well, I think on page 35, I mean, Bart uses uh, phrases that you can easily pass over, where he says, and before we go any further, we must stop a moment and ask ourselves how this word God, God's <laughs> a word. <laughs> what people mm -hmm. think, I mean, it's also a concept, he says, and so on. But God's a word, and as a word, it needs contextualization. And he then says, oh, well, in general, by God, people have diverse understandings. Something had to start it all. Um, this is the name of the necessity to feeling that life has to have meaning and so on. But he is not going to play any of those games because what it means for to say God for Christians is to say Jesus Christ revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. So Trinity is a necessary discipline of the word God. And so, and at the very beginning of how he's going to work is even though he said that, you know, he had little use for philosophy, he's got a kind of philosopher's intelligence that always wants to show what are the fundamental conceptual moves necessary to say as Christians, God. And of course, it is not just saying God, but it is praying to God because God is the name of that subject that is capable of response. Yeah, on page, yeah, on page 35, uh, he said, uh, when we talk about God, he says there, first of all, uh, by the way, we're, we're not talking about what is usually talked about uh, outside the Christian faith. But he says, he, right at the beginning, I, I feel like wants to nail Schleiermacher and any of those who make some move from some human capacity uh, toward God. He said, we're, we're not talking about a universally present longing uh, object of man's homesickness, hope for unity, meaning and existence, meaning of the world. And uh, in the italics at the beginning of chapter five, he says a, a fundamental thing that he carries through and that is uh, only God can reveal God. Only God can give you any information about God. There's no way we can build a ramp from ourselves back toward God. I, I would say in so doing, he has just devastated about 90% of the sermons that I hear uh, in my own family, church family, and many that I preach. And that is uh, the sermon that starts out, have you ever felt like, have you ever wondered that, have you ever wanted and then say, oh, that's God. That that's the move Bart really wants to defeat. I think that that um, kind of sermon reflects 
the fear of preachers that the people to whom they're preaching to share not in com they do not share in common the God of Jesus Christ. So you have to try to locate the word God as the name of some human possibility that will um, uh, help people leave the service thinking that helped me. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. He, uh, it, it, it is, um, it, it's a kind of um, statement that a, a since God doesn't speak, since God doesn't reveal, uh, let, let's work from what we know toward God whom we can't know, don't know. Um, pages 38 and 39 there, um, he says, God surrenders himself. God graciously gives God's self over to our knowing. Uh, he's going to go on to say about how that cannot be a grasping and a receiving kind of knowing, but uh, that's where. But in the Romans, of course, God is holy, other, and so on. And um, that was God is God, and we are not. I mean, mm -hmm. my, my way of putting it is that. For Bart, the question is never, does God exist, but do we? <laughs> Which is a reminder that existence is an analogical term that means that we are fundamentally gifts mm -hmm. in a way that are not self-subsistent. Now, Bart, late, uh, Besides dogmatics and outline, my favorite, other than some of the dogmatics, is the humanity of God. Mm -hmm. And, and he's, he says and, and that God is God and we are not was a necessary claim at the time, but probably one overwrought. <laughs> and, and so, so got, you're pointing to that between like his bombshell Romans, God is totally distant. You're not God. God is only God. Between there and here in 1946 in dogmatics, Bart is doing a kind of uh, a correction or, or further. Uh, well, on page 40, he said uh, uh, that uh, to, to even say God is distant and other is to be guilty of projecting our stuff on God. Uh, that that God's that that God is distant from us precisely in God's gracious nearness to us. But He's, uh, and the humanity of God, he says, God's deity is thus no prison in which He can exist only in and for Himself. Isn't that mm. wonderful? Yeah. It is rather his freedom to be in and for himself, but also with and for us, to assert, but also to sacrifice himself, to be wholly exalted, but also completely humble, not only almighty, but also almighty mercy, not only Lord, but also servant, not only judge, but also himself the judged, not only man's eternal king, but also his brother in time. I mean, a beautiful. He he is making a move there uh, uh, around here. I think you know, God. Uh, God is uh, distant. Uh, God is uh, undefinable. It'd be intellectually limiting to try to say anything definite about God, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Bart says God's godness is precisely in God's. Yeah. Incarnation, of right. nearness, and uh, self-giving. Um, you, you take a claim like God is nearer to us than we are to ourselves. Yeah, that's, that's quite frightening. <laughs> uh, yeah, which is one reason I've uh, 
it, uh, around the academy, it's always when there's a push to keep God talk as vague as one possibly can, uh, as abstract as one can. And I swear, it, I believe it's because that statement is frightening. God is nearer to us than we are nearer. Another thing I find here is that in modernity, uh, we, we start out on the assumption we, we just don't know enough about God to say anything about God. Uh, God is obscure, arcane, undefined. Bart starts right out the back bat uh, by saying, um, we, we got a God that is lavishly self-giving, self-revealing. We, in, in fact, in one place uh, elsewhere, Bart uh, chides preachers for attempting to analyze their congregations and the kind of listeners to whom they preach. And he says, we know more about Christ than we know about any of our people. <laughs> that our, our people are mysterious. They are sly. They are hidden. But Christ doesn't do any of that. So I, um, uh, I, I don't want us to miss again um, um, what I directed attention to last time about a Christian father once rightly said that Dois non es a genre. God is not a genre. Uh, that Christian father was Aquinas. Mm -hmm. and, of course, and people then want to say um, Bart had no use for Aquinas' uh, way of working, in particular, proofs for the existence of God. And he says, nowhere in the scriptures does you see any attempt to prove God. But I think he could have taken a more constructive account of how Aquinas' um, analysis works, because I think Aquinas, I mean, he's, he, you take the proof of infinite causation, and, and uh, so causation has to come to an end, and Aquinas says, and all people call this God. <laughs> uh -huh. now, now, Aquinas yeah. is too uh, canny not to know that that's a leap and all that that final cause to say that's God is a leap because it is the God of Jesus Christ for Aquinas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, that's that's there. I think that one of the ways of construing the proofs is not that this proves God, but rather given that our God is the God of Jesus Christ, you should not be surprised that the world looks this way when you're looking for cause. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so there, is, there could have been a way for Bart to have had a more constructive relationship with... Uh, that, that reminds... As he ends chapter five, he has an attack on art, and uh, I remember, you know, reading that uh, I was quite an art aficionado, and uh, I, I took offense there. I think he could have been more constructive. He he attacks so-called uh, Christian art, uh, basically on the basis of God has so wonderfully, concretely effusively imaged God's self in a Jew from Nazareth, Jesus Christ. You, you know, why, why you don't need all this artistic uh, endeavor. And uh, I kind of think what you just said about Aquinas would apply to art that, hey, don't be surprised that artists uh, come up with uh, the, the images that are helpful and congruent because God is another name for reality. Uh, Only someone as cultured as Bart could be so critical of art. <laughs> uh, true, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that he, that he kept um, uh, the famous uh, Eisenheim uh, yeah. triptych uh, ab above his desk <laughs> is uh, he, uh, he knew how uh, suffering could be a form of beauty. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, uh, um, 
I, chapter I, I, six is short. Uh, wait a minute, I don't want to say oh, five yet. Okay. Uh, uh, we don't want to miss the Bible tells the story of God. It narrates his deeds and histories of this God in the highest as it takes place on earth in the human sphere. I mean, the, that um, Mark had a gesture toward how narrative works to shape the meaning of what we say. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's a very constructive set of suggestions that someone like Hans Fry took yeah. up in a very... Uh, he, he uh, just before he says that, he says something like, uh, uh, scripture never defines God. Right. And I, it's a setup for saying, uh, no, God is rendered through narrative. I mean, that scripture's way in dealing with reality uh, tends to be narrative in form and not uh, through our abstract definitions. The creed itself is a narrative. And of course, yeah. and, and one of the, um, one of the things that's going to be really, um, uh, is one of the observations that he makes that I think is so telling is, how did Pontius Pilate get in it? <laughs> I mean, a minor, a of, minor Roman. <laughs> one of the great <laughs> questions. I mean, Pont, Pont, Pontius Pilate will always be there, and what does that, what does that entail? It means yeah. that you don't have, you don't start abstractly as Christians. You always start within the rough and tumble character of historical particularity which always is going to beg for narrative display. Yeah. I, uh, I think uh, one could ponder Pontius Pilate's presence in the great, which he, which he will later. Uh, but it, it, uh, and that's one thing narrative does is to keep things in history, uh, Somewhere Bart says, salvation means to be caught up in the history of Jesus Christ. Uh, that is God in time, God with us. And that is a historical, uh, yeah. Um, it's not just God in time, it's time. <laughs> uh, which may also be a good, I'm, I'm struck he says in five, uh, what we're talking about when we talk about God and we talk about God's dealings uh, and offering, and we're talking about reality. And I think um, that is a wonderfully evocative phrase that uh, God, in a, in a sense, is another name for reality. It's, yeah, that. Um, um. In terms of, I mean, I think Bart being labeled neo-orthodox uh, does little descriptive good because it sounds like that there's something just there, namely orthodox. And when, when I taught it at um, Notre Dame, uh, the Catholics had a phrase, uh, deposit of the faith. And I, um, and I, the, the, the word deposit for me as a Texan had quite a different connotation, but, <laughs> but, but it, it, people think that Bart is one of these people that just has, this is what you believe. If you don't believe it, go to hell. But in effect, I'm, he is rethinking the grammar of our speech as Christians. And therefore in six, I mean, I believe in God the Father. Well, that's not saying, oh, we need a, a good big daddy. It is Jesus is the son. So you only know fatherhood language because Jesus said, pray like this, and I and the Father uh -huh. are one. So, um, now, now, you know, speaking of neo-orthodoxy, uh, 
Last session, we both admitted when we first encountered BART as students, we, we didn't get it. And um, I know in trying to teach BART uh, in, at, in seminary, uh, it, it, you know, students encounter him as they, they think, oh, he sounds kind of conservative, sounds like a traditionalist and all. Uh, in what ways is like dogmatics and outline um, radical or uh, revolutionary. Uh, I think it'd be great to hear you say a word about that. I, I think to me, Bart is being sly here. He says, hey, I want to do a commentary on the Apostles' Creed. What could be more traditional than that? Why is Bart not giving us an orthodox, neo-orthodox reading of the Creed? Um. I think there's a hidden um, political um, implications in dogmatics and outline that he is trying to recover Christianity as no longer in service to state formations. And, mm. that, um, and that involves a relearning of the language of the faith. And so there's a certain sense that dogmatics and outline, I mean, remember he's, he's in the ruins of uh, Bonn um, a year after the end of the war is saying, we need to recover as Christians how to speak of God when we stand now contrary to a world that brought us such terror. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that um, um, the, uh, that to read Dogmatics and Outline, for example, with Against the Stream, his um, short writings at the same time, um, after the war, you begin to see um, how he is envisioning a Christian alternative that is very hard to even see today because uh -huh. of our compromised uh, status. And that project requires him to go back and rework, uh, for instance, a word that he starts working on here uh, uh, in saying God is an object. God is objective. Uh, in saying that when we talk about God, we're talking about reality. Um, we are not uh, 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 talking about some projection from ourselves toward God. We're talking about God's uh, meeting with us, is the phrase he uses. Uh, it seemed like he, he is busy reworking words that we thought we knew and in so doing reworking uh, a whole uh, way of, you know, practicing the faith. And well, I mean, you take, you take his account of Trinity, uh, I believe in God the Father, already pulling the second article into the first. Mm -hmm. uh, to be displayed by the third. Um, uh, and he says, um, he understands that Trinity is not a number. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you let Trinity become a number, <laughs> you've got some, uh, you're, you've got some insoluble um, uh, um, conceptual problems on your hands. But um, what, um, he, he says and that, of course, the three persons language is classically orthodox, but he's got a problem with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because person language um, uh, um, suggests a kind of individuation mm -hmm. of each member of the Trinity, given modern political developments that he thinks has to be resisted. And uh, I mean, 
So he's got to look for alternative ways of displaying Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, here's another word that I think he's reworking here in seven. Uh, where God is imagined in any sort of apartness, in great remoteness, is page 47. He is not the one who is meant, <laughs> but rather a being who is fundamentally weak. God is not, has not the nature of a shadow. God is opposed to every powerlessness. And he, he's, what I hear him doing here is he's taking like power and saying part of God's power is God's ability uh, to be on a cross or God's ability to reveal and make God's self available uh, to humanity. That So he's busy reworking a word like power to, it, as he reworks, one could make a list going through dogmatics and outline all the words that you think you know what they mean until Bart gets through showing you, no, they it's dialectic, they mean differently. Oh, I think that's, that's right. Uh, words only work in relation to other words. <laughs> and yeah. So he's constantly about that. And, and in relationship to the narrative, like y you kind of have to know the story <laughs> of, of Christ to know why uh, we could say that God's ultimate powerfulness is in God's condescension, in God's, in, as, as the crucified God. Uh, no, the, no. Uh, and he spends a good bit of time talking about power here in, in seven. Uh, it's interesting. He, he doesn't deal much with the Pauline powers. And, mm, and he so, doesn't. I, and I wondered about that. Uh, that um, uh, I suppose he probably doesn't want to deal with the powers, and I don't know that he does anywhere really in dogmatics and outline uh, until he's dealt with creation. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the powers are part of God's original good creation who are in revolt. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so you've got to give an account of creation. I wondered if he was also, you know, the Nazis uh, exalted uh, power and uh, they promised power uh, to the German people. Uh, today I notice, I mean, in, in our present moment, God is often spoken of as with words like, well, I believe God is in control. Uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 God is spoken of as kind of uh, power, which in the present moment with the pandemic and all, it seemed like we're really feeling our total, utterly powerlessness. So then we think of a God as, well, God, God is God precisely in being powerful where we're impotent. And yet Bart is busy saying, ooh, be careful in applying your words to God, uh, whether they be the persons of the Trinity or the God as powerful. Right. I, um, um, I think that for Bart, he doesn't do it in this text so much, but God's powerfulness is revealed in the cross. And you could kill him, but you could not keep him in the grave. And, <laughs> and if you want to know what yeah. power is, it is that. So Bart is always going to resist uh, abstractions like um, God is power um, in and of itself. Uh, that's an abstraction that has to be disabled yeah. by the cross. 
And you know, Bart, um, he spends a lot of time here as we get on into eight and all, but throughout the dog, uh, typically kind of obsessed about epistemology, about how do you know what you know about God? And sometimes that can be represented as, uh, well, we, we just don't have enough information about God. We need more. I think he would want us to say, uh, no, our inability to know God is also because we're, we're always busy uh, applying to God these words like power uh, and all, uh, that holiness, love, that we don't know what those words mean until those words get defined by Jesus Christ. And I think uh, that's right. I, I want to be a little careful by turning Bart into an epistemologist. Okay. Um, I think Bart represents a turn against the epistemological tradition began with Descartes, who wanted to um, give an account of how we know what we know prior to any knowing that we know. Um, and of course, you get the famous um, I, uh, I doubt. Um, that is knowledge without God, without revelation. I, I think Bart doesn't try to give an account of knowledge qua knowledge. I think uh, in the way classical metaphysicians would talk, ontology precedes what we know. And uh, therefore, for him, uh, it's not like you're able to stand back from what it is you know and ask how you know it, but that you first have to acknowledge what you know. And uh, that's where he's, he doesn't start with trying to give a rational account of what I might believe, but rather he starts with belief. Mm. I, I think that that's really uh, illustrated well by page 53. Uh, but also he wants to say you, uh, where he makes a statement like, you don't know the world as creation until you know Jesus Christ. Right. That, that, um, I think, I think, um, uh, what he does with creation is just crucial because people think, oh, I have a lot of trouble with thinking that out of all the world, God chose Israel to be my promised people, which climaxes for Christians in Christ. Um, uh, it's a hell of a narrative. Um, uh, but uh, I have trouble believing that kind of particular claims, but I believe something had to start it off. So I believe God's creator. Well, exactly what Bart wants to um, resist is the presumption that you know creation from something had to start at all. <laughs> that there, um, what cre creation for him is an eschatological claim that you know because you've seen the end. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so the end already is at work in, I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. So creation okay. is part of God's redemption of the world through Christ. I, I believe um, in the creed, when we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I've thought, okay, nine out of 10 Americans, I believe would sign off on that. Say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something, something had to get all started. I think though, when you say, and, <laughs> that's when uh, the people start checking out. And at the same time, uh, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. Uh, that That is the move. Um, we read God from that first acclamation, God is creator. Uh, Bart wants us to read it from the son back to the father. You don't 
know the father if it hadn't been for the son you don't know the world you don't know creation right. and and nor do you know yourself um he as he's talking about the world he very subtly shifts to us and say you know you don't know that the world is creation without the son's redemption and also you don't you don't know yourself until christ tells you shows you who you are uh, on page 54 he says is it not true that if we confront existence not least our own existence we can but in astonishment state the truth and reality of the fact that i may exist <laughs> <laughs> the world yeah. may exist, yeah. although it is a reality distinct from God, although the world, including man and therefore myself, is not God. God in the highest, the triune God, the Father, the Almighty, is not arbitrary. He does not grudge existence to this other. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he kind of mocks. Our big question is, is there a God? Uh, <laughs> no, the question is... It, are you there? <laughs> uh, I must say, uh, this is also being said in the context of the existentialist, uh, Camus, Sartre, and all, for whom existence became uh, problematic. And it's like Bart is swimming in that milieu uh, of, of and, and maybe here at the end of World War II uh, with the dashed hopes and et cetera, uh, the fragility of the human seems particularly prominent. And uh, there's, there's in, in this chapter on, on creation, um, later on page 93, um, uh, he, um, um, he, he says, um, he says at the bottom, at this point, I should like in passing to answer a question which has been put to me several times during these, these weeks. Are you not aware that many are sitting in this class who are not Christian? <laughs> I've always laughed and said, that makes no difference to me. <laughs> it would be quite dreadful if the faith of Christians should aim at sundering and separating one man from the other. It is in fact the strongest motive for collecting men and and binding them together. And what bind is this? Quite simply and challenging at the same time the commission which the community has to deliver its message. If we consider the matter once more from the standpoint of the community, that is from the standpoint of those who seriously wish to be Christians, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, we must remember that everything will depend upon Christians not painting, not painting for the non-Christians in a word, indeed a picture of the Lord or an idea of Christ but on their succeeding with their human words and ideas and pointing to Christ himself. <laughs> and, I, and then later uh, he says, well, you know, you think it's, it's going to be hard to believe in Jesus? Try creation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> he, he says, it's, it's just astounding. There's a world. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, that again, we keep, um, in modernity talking about you know jesus is a shadowy figure uh we just don't have the historical data we need uh to make a statement um we are limited uh, by the historical retrieval uh we're limited uh bart begins with what i can only call a kind of sumptuousness that the one thing we know for sure with absolute certainty is Jesus Christ. Um, and that, uh, whereas um, I was reading a preacher the other day who said, uh, uh, you can't really know the Bible. Uh, you can't really move into a sermon without excruciating self-knowledge. You've got to know who you are. Uh, where have you come from? Uh, who makes you who you are? Then you're able uh, to, to go to scripture, uh, to go before a congregation. And I thought, you know, to, 
to make that kind of statement after the ravages of psychology, sociology, gender studies, which, which sort of show us how arcane and complex we are to, to say, you're actually capable of knowing yourself. And that makes you capable then of making judgments about Christ. I hear Bart saying, no, uh, start with Christ because that's certain, that is sure, that is the key. Yeah, so. I, um, I think um, it's important to make sure that we understand for him creation itself is the gratuity of God. We don't have to exist, but we do. He Gratuitously. Says, yeah. Uh, on 54, this is the riddle of creation. And the doctrine of creation answers that God, who does not need us, created heaven and earth and myself of sheer fatherly kindness and compassion, apart from any merit or worthiness of mine for all of which I am bound to thank and praise him, to serve him and to be obedient, which is assuredly true. Do you feel in these words, Luther's amazement in the face of creation of the goodness of God, in which God does not will to be alone, but to have a reality beside himself. Creation is grace. I mean, it's- uh, Does not will to be alone. The world came into being, it was created and sustained by a little child that was born in Bethlehem, page 58, mm -hmm. by a man who died on a cross at Golgotha and the third day rose again. That is the word of creation. Uh, that's, that he, that's a very different way of reading the world. How far were we to go? Were we to go to, through chapter nine? Uh, no, I think through eight. Uh, through eight. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 let, me, uh, let me ask again. Uh, what what makes this for you uh, a fresh, radically different word? A dogmatics and outline. I think um, that the language has a joyous resonance that frees us from our self preoccupations with uh, whether um, uh, we, uh, we really are Christians. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's a certain sense that Bart frees us from our subjectivities. And um, I, uh, <laughs> God's sake, I, um, be free from our subjectivities. Bart frees us from our subjectivities. Uh, yeah, it through Slarmarker and Pietism and all evangelicalism, we we made Christianity problematic, and it became our assignment, our problem. You need to believe this. You need to decide that. Uh, Bart really wants to free us from that and say. Uh, the work has already been done. Uh, the yes has been spoken. He puts that in caps. Uh, uh, your yes is subsequent. It is interesting, but it is never decisive. And in, in where you are with God, I, I think that's a radical. Uh, and in the present moment, I, I was yesterday reading uh, Bart in his evangelical theology. And he was saying to preachers, uh, don't spend too much time on morbid subjects like Moscow or Washington or uh, the, 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 the atomic bomb or whatever. Uh, stay with the joyful uh, subjects like Jesus Christ. And I notice, um, you know, in the, in the present pandemic and preaching and all it, it is tempting to take our moment as we define it uh, more seriously than we take God's definition of us 
in Jesus Christ. Uh, you will be my people. I will be your God. Uh, we have to be careful. I, um, um, why does God let bad things happen to good people? That kind of question mm -hmm. is um, generated, it seems to me, by profoundly uh, superficial accounts of, um, of our lives together. And um, there's not anything superficial about Bart. I mean, he has a sense of the depth of suffering in which um, we exist that um, does credit to the Psalms. And um, when I say that I sense in him a joyfulness, and it's a category that is very important for him, joy, that I sense that's joyfulness. The joy always comes on the side of a stark realism about uh, we are creatures destined to die. Hmm. Yeah, and I, uh, Good Friday has always got to be kept, Holy Saturday <laughs> and Easter together. Um, and, um, but, but to be able to say we are creatures who have to die, um, that affirmation can sometimes only come uh, after the affirmation, uh, we are those to whom God has turned. We are those to whom God goes to extraordinary lengths to keep up the conversation. Um, I know in, uh, uh, we were to have a homiletics uh, conference on uh, preaching and ecology, preaching and earth care, uh, the care of the earth and all. And, and I don't mean to sound uh, like a, a kind of Christian know-it-all or exclusivist, but when you get into these conversations, uh, it kind of, I think Christians ought to admit we're, we're kind of limited <laughs> because we actually believe we are mortal. Uh, we are terminal. Uh, death, it, it, that, um, and I think we live in a, a culture which assumes that's, that's optional because it doesn't really have any other way of thinking about our mortality than to think it is something unpleasant that we may with the right scientific help overcome. Right. I guess um, we yeah. questions. Yeah, uh, Karsten, uh, have you got some questions for us in the Q&A? Yeah, we've got some questions. Um, no surprise there. So I've got a couple questions around how Bart uses this idea of the persons of the Trinity as um, ways of being and what's going on with that language. But then especially as that regards to his like um, analogical theology of language where he's saying we only understand what our words mean, which y'all touched on earlier in relation to who God is, um, how far we can take that and then especially with Mother's Day being on Sunday, um, what Bart's doctrine of God as father might tell us about um, motherhood or maybe God's motherhood or something like that. Hmm. Stanley, I mean, you brought up the persons. <laughs> well, uh, let, me, let me respond about yeah. motherhood. All right, motherhood. Um, when the feminist um, started um, theological revision, um, the fatherhood language seemed um, uh, particularly offensive um, and thus would say, well, I have trouble worshiping God the Father because my father was a very bad father and therefore my association of fatherhood language with God 
um, only reminds me of that. I my response is say would say, uh, well, you're in a better position to worship God the Father because it's not that God's a good big daddy, but that Jesus is the Son, in which we then learn that God's the Father who is determined to be related to us. That doesn't mean that there's not language possible of calling God mother. Uh, indeed, um, uh, obviously, um, that has been done in Christian tradition by some of the great saints that, um, uh, but uh, the fatherhood language uh, seems to me uh, um, extremely important just to the extent that Jesus is the son and through the Lord's prayer uh, instructed us how to pray uh, to his father who becomes our father and mother through him. Um, it's um, tricky business, um, but that would be my way of trying to respond to that. Um, the person of Mark's um, attempt to uh, discuss the Trinity uh, in, as, as modes, uh, I mean, he was acutely aware he wanted to avoid modalist accounts of the Trinity, that is, uh, where the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit are just modes of the same being in a way that um, meant that they didn't have subsistence, existence um, in relationship to one another. Uh, he, he struggled mightily with those um, issues and it's not clear that he ever felt he had done so satisfactorily. What is your view on that, Will? I'm just really taken with Bart's uh, talk about the Trinity as God's self-repetition. Uh, three ways of, of God's repeating God's self. Uh, the Father, uh, God repeating as the Father. I, I, uh, Bart says of theology, we can only repeat ourselves. We're not looking for originality. I use, yeah, I use that in with the grain of the universe. Yeah, we can only repeat ourselves to good but, effect. And, and I like so I like that three modes that the sun is the the self repetition um, of the Father and and the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, but uh, Lord. Um, Bruce McCormick at Princeton uh, has taken <laughs> the study of Bart on the Trinity so deep, uh, I can't get air when I'm reading it. Um, but uh, it is, again, Bart begins his church dogmatics with the longest exposition of the Trinity in 500 years. Wow. I think that basically shows, Bart says, if if there's not a trinity, if there's not an intra community give God with the Father speaking to the Son, the Son speaking to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, we got nothing to say about God. And that, in a sense, the thing that Bart finds so wonderful about the Trinity is the Trinity's revealedness uh, as revealer. Yeah, all oh, that seems right. We have a, a little bit of a clarification about the question um, where um, Amina, I think, or Nathan, whichever one, was wondering a little bit more about what we learn about motherhood from God, maybe more so than the propriety of designating God as mother. Mm. Say that again, Carson. So they were, they were wondering maybe a little bit more about how what we can learn, if, if we learn what fatherhood is from God and only secondarily from our experience of human families, 
um, which is kind of how I understood your also your point about the broken family maybe setting us up better to understand who God is as Father. Um, then what does that say about how we understand motherhood in like a human family from God, if, if it, the analogical interval works the same way? I'm trying to find the passage. Oh, we, uh, on page 43 at the bottom, he says, the divine fatherhood is the primal source of all natural fatherhood. As is said in Ephesians, every fatherhood in heaven and on earth is of him. We are thinking the truth, the first and proper truth, when we see God the Father in the ultimate, when we recognize him as a father and may be called his children. God the Father, in these words, we are speaking of God's way of being as a source of origin of another divine way of being, or the second one, and so on. So he wants to ground what you mean by natural fatherhood in divine fatherhood, which I take it to be a understanding of, of how, our, how we should understand fatherhood is analogous in a way that says uh, that the father, uh, the natural father, has um, uh, callings made possible by God being the father. He does and, and you would apply that to motherhood. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Now, um, Bart um, doesn't say in 3-4, uh, that um, you have to be a Christian, you have to be married. <laughs> he doesn't say that because um, uh, it doesn't mean that everyone uh, is called to biological fatherhood from the fatherhood of God. It does mean that all in the church, whether they have children or not, have a vocation of parenting. <laughs> yeah, I th I've, and I think it's tough in our milieu to talk about these matters because for most of us, uh, motherhood, fatherhood, family is the closest we come to church. Uh, and it is, it is our kind of substitute for discipleship. And I think Bart would would question that no question <laughs> and uh, so um, yeah I, I I think um, yeah okay maybe I that's yeah, so got um, another question that we had today um, relates to Bart's idea of participation um, where he is one participant noted, famously rejected um, the doctrine of the analogy of being, and yet at the same time on page 45, he talks about um, God inviting us to participate in God's nature. Um, so, so how do we hold this idea of otherness on one time, on one side that Bart holds so strongly to, with also where he seems to point maybe towards a doctrine of deification? How long you got? <laughs> the um, uh, Bart um, obviously um, rejected the analogia entis, um, but um, thought he could develop analogia fide, uh, and it seems he tries to do that in the um, Anselm book. People miss the fact, however, that in two one. He says that Songren, a Roman Catholic's account of the Analogia Entis as a form of grace, if that's what Catholics really believed, uh, the Analogia Entis uh, um, was saying, then uh, he would have to become a Roman Catholic, but he said that's not what Roman Catholics really believe. <laughs> they really believe in the Analogia Entis as um, a strict possibility of having uh, knowledge of God 
without uh, knowledge of Christ. And he's not ever going to go uh, down that road. Um, I, um, I think the differences are um, not nearly as uh, substantial as many people um, portray them, given his analogia. Uh, fetus account in the Anselm book. Yeah, I, I feel that it, it became a vic the, the the argument became a victim of being an argument, and that Bart um, was he is so determined that we are not to make any kind of uh, uh, relationship continuousness with God from us. Uh, it, but that. God graciously comes to us. It's also, I think, as you said, Stanley, he's this analogy talk, he's talking about knowledge. How, how do we know? And uh, he would be, he said, we do it, no guy, and we are surprised that, like our experience of motherhood or fatherhood or family, or so, we, we're surprised. Wow, this does, it is revealing. It does seem, um, to have God in it. And Bart would, I would think would say, well, yeah, that's because it's reality is God. And therefore that whole discussion to me, I think Bart just got trapped in arguing with the Roman Catholic Church of his day as he understood it. And then, uh, so. What he really, what he, uh, he would, the analog of interest was, um, uh, of, of the same kind of status as um, uh, neo-Protestantism. And mm. he, he, the one seemed to be the same structural uh, set as the other. And it was, the, it was liberal Protestantism that he really hated. Um, he was much closer to the Catholics than he was to the Protestants in, in this regard. And that, that's what was behind so much of the polemics that was involved with the Analogians. Yeah, and he, he admired uh, Catholicism as he had known it and experienced it. Uh, he, he, as, wrote, he wrote nine, the famous response to Brunner on natural law while looking out over the Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> oh, true. Okay. Um, yeah, he, he said, I wish Protestants regarded the sermon the same way Catholics regard the mass, the Eucharist, uh, that, that, that transubstantiation. Yes. Uh, well, here, our time's up. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we'll be back uh, same time uh, next week and forge ahead. Uh, on the next chapters in Dogmatics and Outline. Your response has been amazing. Thank but you. Before we close out, we've got a request that one of you could pray for us. Stanley's checked out. No, I'm here. Oh, oh, okay. Wait just a minute. Let me... Uh, Can you pray without the Book of Common Prayer? <laughs> I, I prefer not, but... Uh, yeah, well, we, I, want to, we want this to come right from your heart. Well, I always loved Lyle Walker, the former... Um, Senator from Connecticut, and when they were debating on the House floor whether they could have uh, school prayer, they, one senator said, "Well, why can't we just have silent prayer?" And he said, "We can't have silent prayer because it's against my um, my uh, my church." And they said, "Really? Why?" He said, "I'm an Episcopalian." <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe in silent prayer. Uh, I'm good. not praying, but I'll try to uh, pray. God of time, Lord of creation, we feel lost in the cosmos. We are not sure what's happening to us. We're not sure how to respond. Help us receive you 
as the Lord of all that is, making it possible for us to rejoice in your befriending us so that we might befriend one another in times of loneliness and isolation. Make us love one another and even ourselves so that we might see in a world that seems lost that we are in contact with one another by being made in your image. Thank you for this time together. May it feel as though we are enjoying one another and you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.